want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. David said that he was jealous that I got to preach this passage, but seniority's got to count for something. Um, so I get prime effect. Actually, David was originally scheduled to preach this passage, uh, but because we wanted to avoid what's happening this morning uh, for as long as we could, uh, me both leading worship and preaching, David has gotten to preach the last couple of times, and so it just happened to fall uh, in the Lord's will. Uh, that we would be looking at this uh, passage this morning. So, Colossians chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 15 through 23. You find your way there. I would like to invite you once more to stand with me as I read for us God's Word this morning. One of the best Christological passages in the whole New Testament. Paul says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed, if indeed, you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that you have sent your son Jesus, the creator, the sustainer, the savior of the world, so that all who have put their hope and trust in his life and death and resurrection can be reconciled holy blameless, above reproach, reconciled back to God. I pray, Lord, that this good gospel news of who Jesus is and what he has done for us, Lord, would penetrate our hearts this morning. For those who believe in you, Lord, may this passage humble us from our prideful arrogance, uh, our uh, self-reliance and our self-righteousness. Help us to repent of those things, Lord. For those who do not yet believe in you. Father, I pray that they would see their need for a Savior. That no matter how hard they work, they cannot pay the debt that Christ paid for them. And Lord, I pray that you would help them by the power of your Holy Spirit this morning to bow their knee to their supreme Savior, Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I I really love the hymn that we sang to open our service this morning. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Uh, When we sing this song, my eyes are usually drawn to the second verse that we sing, which says this. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Robert Robertson was born on September 27, 1735. 
Robinson's father died when he was a really young boy, and so as a young child, he was forced into labor in order to provide and to help his family. And, and Robinson, just like many teenagers uh, do today, became friends with a shady group of characters, a, a bit of a scoundrel group. And on one occasion, I guess they didn't have enough to do, and so they thought it would be fun uh, to go to a fortune teller who was on the street and to get their fortunes read to them. Now, they didn't have any money to pay her to tell them their futures, so they bribed her with alcohol. They got her punch drunk so that they, she would tell them uh, their future for free. I guess that's what you do when you don't have YouTube or Netflix. Right? <clears throat> the story goes that the fortune teller told Robinson that he would live to see a very old age. In fact, he would live long enough not only to see his children and his grandchildren, but also his great-grandchildren. On another occasion, he and his friends decided that they wanted to go hear a really famous preacher named George Whitfield. Now, in that day, George Whitfield was probably uh, the second most popular guy in the entire world. Uh, he traveled all over Europe and all over the United States preaching, and it was through the ministry of George Whitfield and and some of his contemporaries, that the first great awakening happened. And so uh, he went to go hear Whitfield preach with his group of friends uh, to this huge crowd, and, and they had planned to poke fun of the preacher, and they had planned to cause a big scene and a big interruption. However, by God's providence, Whitfield's sermon text that day was Luke 3, 7. Luke 3, 7, in which Jesus says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Robinson went that day, fully expecting to cause a riot, but the Lord got a hold of his heart, and he repented that day, and he placed his trust in Christ, and eventually he became a pastor. Robinson is the one who wrote the words to the hymn, as an autobiography of what Jesus did for him. He sought him when a stranger, wandering far from the fold of God. And to save him, he interposed his precious blood. This story brings us to ask the question, how in the world can a poor, rotten, dirty scoundrel of a sinner like Robert Robinson be saved? How is it that Jesus is able to pursue sinners like you and like me when we are wandering far from the fold of God and for us interpose his precious blood. Well, our sermon text this morning helps us to answer that question. This text is perhaps probably the high point of Paul's theology in the letter to the Colossians, but more than that, this text is the high point, one of the high points in the entire New Testament, one of the clearest Christological statements in the entire New Testament. That means one of the clearest passages of Scripture that tells us exactly who Jesus is. There is so much that we can learn from just these few verses. We could spend hours, but we won't. So here's the main summary of what I want us to take away this morning. We must stand firm in the only true gospel of Jesus, who is the supreme Lord and Savior of all creation. Let me say that again. We must stand firm in the only true gospel of Jesus, who is the supreme Lord and Savior of all creation. So that brings us to point number one. If you're looking there in your notes and your bulletin, you can see there, You've got two points. Point number one. Jesus is creation's supreme Lord, sustainer, and Savior. Jesus is creation's supreme Lord, sustainer, and Savior. Another way you might say this based off of these verses is that Jesus is creation's creator, sustainer, and Savior. He created the world. He sustains the world. And he saved the world. Now you should notice here in these first five verses that Paul repeats these words, he is, over and over. That's what gives structure to these verses. 
He is, he is, he is. Four times Paul tells us about who Jesus is. And that's Paul's point. He wants us to remember who Jesus is. Now, these might seem like basic fundamental truths uh, to preach to a room full of Christians. But brothers and sisters, we need to be reminded of these fundamental truths. I think Paul's point here is if we stray away from these fundamental truths, we have strayed far from the fold of God. So I want us to look a little bit deeper into three of these he is statements to see that Jesus is creation's supreme Lord, sustainer, and savior. It's only when we know who Jesus is that we can know how we're supposed to respond to him. We don't know how to respond unless we know who he is. So let's look at who Paul says Jesus is. First, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You see that there in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Paul begins this passage by describing who Jesus is in two ways. He's the image of the invisible God, and he's the firstborn of all creation. This description ought to remind you of the story of, from Genesis chapters 1 and 2 when God created the earth. Right? God created all things, but at the height of his creation, he made Adam and Eve. And, and what set Adam and Eve apart from the rest of God's creation is that Adam and Eve, he created in his image. Right? So Adam and Eve's image bearing uh, means that it set them apart from the rest of what God created because they were to function as God's representative authority over the earth. Right? They were to fill the earth and they were to subdue it. Uh, they were charged uh, to take care of every living thing. They were given a garden in which they were to work. Right? And so Adam and Eve, uh, Adam was charged to give a name to every living thing. Right? So part of Adam and Eve's image bearing is that they were God's representative authority over his created world. But Jesus is much more than just an intermediary. He, he's much more than just a representative authority like Adam and Eve. Paul here, I believe, has in mind that Jesus is the perfect intermediary. He is the perfect imprint between God and man. He makes the invisible visible and knowable. John 1.14 says and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth i love the story of jesus talking to his disciples in john chapter 14 uh, have you ever wondered uh, maybe what the conversation around the dinner table was at the last supper uh, well john gives us a little bit of a glimpse Right? Jesus is reminding his disciples that he's about to leave them. He's about to go away, and he, he tells them that he's going to his father's house. And in his father's house, there are many mansions, and he's going there to prepare a place for his disciples uh, so that, that where he is, there they one day might also be. And, and the disciples are troubled by this. They don't know what to make of what Jesus is saying. They haven't put all the pieces together yet and so they start to say to jesus jesus how are we going to get over to your father's house we don't know the way we don't we don't have directions right it's before gps was invented uh, we don't know where we're supposed to go and you remember jesus's response i am the way the truth and the life and then after those famous verses philip we don't really hear a whole lot from philip in the new testament but philip speaks up and he asks something that only a few people in the entire scripture were bold enough to ask. He says, Jesus, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. Just give us a glimpse of the Father. Kind of reminds you of Moses, doesn't it? When he's standing on Mount Sinai, and he says to God, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. But do you remember what Jesus said to Philip? He said, Philip, how have I been with you for so long long? 
and you still don't know me. He says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Jesus says, Philip, you want to see the Father? Look at me. I am the image of the invisible God. Here's the point. Jesus is the eternal, divine, authoritative Son of God come to earth to reveal to us our Heavenly Father and His plan for our salvation. Jesus came to earth so that we might know God. So friends, let me ask you this morning. Do you know who God is? I don't mean the God that you've invented in your mind, but I mean the God as He has revealed Himself in His Son. The God who has revealed Himself in His Word made flesh. If you want to know who God is this morning, look no further than Jesus. He is the perfect image of the invisible God. Second, He is before all things. He is before all things. Next, Paul here says that Jesus is before all things and in Him all things hold together. Right? So it's important to see here that Paul says that Jesus is before all things. Now that corrects something that we might get wrong from that first verse, that he was the firstborn. Right? So we may think that, oh, Jesus is the firstborn, so Jesus was created before the rest of the world. No, 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 no. No, Jesus always was. Jesus didn't come into existence in Bethlehem in a manger. He always was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There was never a time in which Jesus was not. He always has been with God the Father and God the Spirit. He is before all things. Before all things were, Jesus was. This is one of the things that makes Jesus completely different from you and me. Jesus became like us in many ways, but one of the ways that Jesus is entirely different is there was once a time when you and I were not, right? But there was never a time in which Jesus was not. He always has been. You see, you and I came into existence when, when God formed us in our mother's wombs. But one of the things that makes Jesus remarkably different from us and separates him from us is that there never was a time when he was not. He didn't come into existence uh, when he was created in, or when he uh, was placed by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb, right? Uh, he took on himself a human nature at that point, but he was before that. Again, John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Paul here is saying that Jesus is truly and fully God. Uncreated. Always existing from eternity past all the way into eternity future. And because he is this eternal son of God, he says, Paul says next, that he sustains his creation. All things were made by him. He was in the beginning and all things were made by by him so he's the creator of the world but not only that he is the sustainer of all the world right not one molecule of the created order flies into chaos because jesus holds it in control all things belong to him and brothers and sisters this ought to bring you massive comfort this morning have you ever felt like, or maybe you feel like today, that this world is just out of control lately? You feel like that? See the chaos around us? The chaos of this last year? And everything that that's brought? I mean, you realize that what we've lived through in this last year probably will be talked about for generations to come. This last year has been one for the history books. Does the political... In the social unrest of today, stress you out? Friends, this passage reminds you today 
that Jesus is Lord and sustainer of his creation. Nothing, nothing is outside of his sovereign control from the biggest countries on the planet to the tiny microscopic viruses. Jesus holds all things together. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Third, he's the head of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. In other words, Jesus is our supreme Savior. He's the head of the church, the head of a people that he has redeemed for himself. As the church, he is our ultimate authority, but more than that, Right? He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the down payment on the new creation promises that God promised way back in Genesis 3.15. He has accomplished our salvation through His life and death. And here Paul reminds us through His resurrection. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we have hope that we too will be raised to live eternally with Him if we trust in Him. And verse 19 says that Jesus is fully God and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, making peace by the blood of His cross. Here's the gospel truth this morning. Jesus, the Lord and sustainer of all creation, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, took upon Himself a human nature and became a man just like you and me. But unlike you and me, he was never created. He always was. And also, unlike you and me, he never sinned. You see, you and I, we're sinners. And and we deserve God's wrath. We deserve punishment and death because of our sin. But Jesus lived a perfect life that you and I could never live. Even if we tried as hard as we could, we could never live a perfect life. And he died on the cross to reconcile us back to himself. And he rose from the dead so that we might be saved if we repent of our sins and put our trust in him. So let me ask you this morning, if you're not a Christian, if you don't confess faith in Christ and you don't consider yourself to be a Christian, let me ask you, who are you trusting in? In the chaos of the world around us, where's your hope? Jesus is the only supreme Savior. And so I would implore you this morning to trust in Him today. Point number two. Point number two. We must be steadfast in the only true gospel. We must be steadfast in the only true gospel. Notice here Paul makes a transition from talking about who Jesus is And there in verse 21, he says, he turns the tables and he says, and you, right? So he's been saying, Jesus is, Jesus is, Jesus is, and you. Now in verse 21, that ought to catch our attention. And you were once alienated and hostile, right? Doing evil deeds. Alien and hostile, doing evil deeds. Paul begins this section by reminding the Colossian church about who they were before they heard and received the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the way that the Bible constantly describes those who do not believe in Christ. They are hostile to the Lord. They are alienated from God. And they do evil deeds. Now Christian, that ought to inspire a little bit of humility in you this morning particularly towards those who don't yet believe. Right? We realize, or we ought to realize, that we too were once, and sometime can, you know, sometimes we can still be, just as awful and just as sinful as the worst sinners around us that don't yet believe in Christ. We like to dress up and act like we're pretty well off, but if we're honest with ourselves, we're not. In another letter, the Apostle Paul wrote, Uh, about the same time as this letter in in the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 2, he says, and you were dead 
in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. But Paul doesn't end there. But if that's who we once were, look at who Paul says we are presently because of what Christ has done. In verse 22, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. You were once alienated and hostile, and now through Christ you are reconciled. Right? You once were a worker of evil deeds, but now through Christ you are justified, you are holy, you are blameless before him. Right? Reconciled, holy, and blameless. If you are in Christ, this is who you now are. Reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And friends, if this is true of you, this is true of you on your best day, and it's also true of you on your worst day. On your best day, you are a sinner who is bought by the blood of Christ and reconciled back to God, holy and blameless. And on your worst day, you are a forgiven sinner who is covered by the blood of Jesus, reconciled back to God. So we need to listen to this passage this morning. Let it be an encouragement to us, especially on our worst of days. But notice that all of this comes with a condition. <laughs> it all comes with a condition. Verse 23, right? All of this comes with a condition. If indeed you continue with the faith. If. Man, that two-letter word brings up so many questions. Right? These things are true of you if. You continue in the faith, stable, steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. I want you to notice here that this condition has nothing to do with your works. Paul does not say here that Christ purchased salvation for you if you do these good deeds to earn it. Nor does Paul say that Christ purchase re redemption and reconciliation and forgiveness and holiness and blamelessness and all those things are yours if you stay in God's good favor. That's not what Paul says either. No, the condition has nothing to do with us earning or keeping our salvation. He says we must remain steadfast in faith and in hope of the gospel. Faith and hope. Now, it's important for us to keep some context in mind here. One of the main reasons why Paul wrote this letter to begin with is that the Colossian church had been upset by these false teachers who had begun sprouting up and leading people astray from the gospel. Okay, We don't know exactly who these false teachers were, but Paul gives us some hints, some clues as to what they were teaching, the false gospel that they were teaching. So in chapter 2, verse 8, Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, not according to Christ. And then a, a few verses later, in, in chapter 2, verse 16, he says, Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to festival or new moon or Sabbath. And he goes on to talk about how these false teachers were promoting the worship of angels rather than the worship of Jesus. So here, Paul is warning the Colossian church, don't be swept away by this false teaching. Don't be led astray by this false gospel. Warning passages like this one bring up all kinds of hard questions for us, but 
there's one in particular that if you're engaged right now mentally, you're probably thinking, right? Uh, I, I can't read your minds, but I, I think this is probably what most people are probably wrestling with. Can a person who is a genuine believer in Christ lose their faith? Right? Can, can a person who is genuinely trusting in Jesus lose their faith? And there are warning passages like this all over the New Testament. So how do these warning passages square with what we wholeheartedly affirm as Baptists in this church that's a part of our statement of faith that once a person is genuinely saved, that person is secure in Christ? How do warning passages like this and all over the New Testament square with that teaching? Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Now, well, let me get ahead of myself. There, there are two ways, that we, two things we need to keep in mind here as we seek to answer that question because I think you can reconcile those things. I don't think they're contradictory to one another. But we have to affirm two things. The first thing that we have to affirm is the promise of, the Bible's promise is that God will save to the utmost those who trust in Christ. We have to affirm those promises, right? Philippians 1, 6, right? He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it, right? Also, John 10, 28, Jesus says, I give them life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. So we affirm that our salvation is, is God's work from start to finish. And what he starts, he finishes. But second, we do have to affirm that these warning passages are real, right? These aren't hypothetical situations. All of these warning passages, these conditional passages, they're real in the Scripture. We are called to persevere in our faith. Jesus also says in Matthew 24, 13, that the one who perseveres to the end, that's the one who will be saved. So here's how I think these two things work together. I think these warning passages are part of the means by which God helps us to persevere. Okay? God gives us these warning passages to help us not to shift away from the firm hope that we have in the gospel. Because if we place our hope in any other gospel than Jesus Christ crucified and risen, let me be clear, you will perish picture a child playing in a backyard with a ball he's playing with the ball the ball gets away from him and rolls into the street and so the child runs to go get his ball out of the street and as a parent you step back and you see your child running after that ball in the middle of the street and you also see a car barreling down the road not paying a bit of attention and you yell out to your child, Stop! Stop! Your child hears the warning and stops, and the child's life is spared. These conditional passages, these warning passages like this one in verse 23, they're like God as the parent who's stepping back and looking at the impending danger and looking at the way that we are so prone to stray and yelling, stop, right? They are the means, these commands, these conditional statements are the means by which God saves our faith. So we need to listen to these passages today. As confessing Christians, we can so often be tempted by all kinds of other gospels, other false gospels, other hopes. We can place our faith in our works, in being a good person, and having wealth, a nice home, a stable job, a good family. But here's the thing. None of those things can save you. Only Jesus can save. Do not shift away from that gospel. Hold fast to Jesus. All other ground is sinking you remember our friend Robert Robinson. He wrote, there's a fountain, or come thou fount of every blessing. For some unfortunate reason that history doesn't record for us, later in his life, Robinson became very unstable and extremely unhappy. His Christian faith became of very little importance to him, 
Uh, he eventually denied the divinity of Jesus. Uh, he denied the Trinity. Uh, he claimed uh, that this Savior that he once loved so well was no longer God's divine Son. We have one more story from Robinson's life. He was on a stagecoach, uh, traveling from one point to another, and he was sharing a ride with a young lady who, in order to pass the time, uh, began to sing. And she began to sing, not knowing who Robinson was, she began to sing these words. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. As she finished that song, she looked at Robinson and said, what do you think of my singing? Robertson, Robert Robinson reportedly replied, Madam, I am the very unhappy man who wrote that hymn very many years ago, and I would give a thousand worlds if I had them to feel right now as I felt when I wrote them. Friends, who are you trusting in today? Where is your faith? Are you trusting in any other Savior besides Jesus? And I want you to know today that those are false saviors. Only Jesus is the supreme Savior. There is no other Savior apart from Christ. Or perhaps you're here today and you have confessed faith in Christ for many years. Are you prone to wonder? Is there anything that is in your life today that is competing for your heart's affection. The application this morning is that you are to repent of those things. You are to flee from those idols and you are to find again your hope in the only true and sufficient Savior. Let's pray together. Jesus, we confess this morning that you are our sufficient and supreme Savior. I pray today that if there are any who are here this morning who have yet to trust in you, Lord. Help them to see that you are their Savior. You are the way that they can be saved. Lord, I pray that they would put their trust in you. Lord, I pray for those of us who are here, all of us this morning, who are prone to wander. Prone to wander in so many different ways, in so many different directions, to leave the God that we love. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to repent of those things, to renew our faith in Christ, to persevere and to stand firm in the gospel not straying from our Savior. We pray these things in the name of Jesus.